We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are going to Monaco, finally. We're going to Monaco. I'm so excited. This is like the most exciting week of F1. I don't like... I don't I don't have it to say anything else. It's podcast over. <laughs> yeah, done. Um, I just I love it. And we, we talked about this right before we started recording, but like ESPN has been hyping up this specific race for weeks. Like even going into like Imola, they're like, screw Imola. We don't care about Imola, which actually, you know, in hindsight was correct. Um, but they're like, Monaco Grand Prix, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Um, for like weeks. And here we are. Yeah. I I think it was like free practice one when I saw the first commercial for Monaco. And I'm like, guys, we're a week out. Why are we doing this already? Because they were ready to move on from Imola. <laughs> Everyone was ready for Imola to be over. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. we are back pretty close together. Oh, there's another, ex- not ex- I don't want to say explosion, but there's another, um, March coming down my street so apologies there. yeah you're you're having that. you're having a fun day down in and Buenos Aires oh <laughs> uh, you never know what protests we're protesting for or what's going on but yeah currently we have drumming and what sounds like fireworks going off on my street so classic never never a dull moment here um but we are coming back pretty close back to we do have back-to-back races we were in Imola last week we're in Monaco this week not a ton of news coming out but we do have a little bit of exciting things for uh people in the U.S. we are getting more F1 arcades I'm excited um they are going to be opening an F1 arcade in Las Vegas in 2025 which will be the third venue Um, There's one in Boston. There's one opening later this year in Washington, D.C. And I think there's plans for like 30 or so over the next five years, um, which I think is super cool. I've never personally been to one. We were talking. We need to go. I think Boston's our target right now. Um, Yeah. Okay, I'm actually like mildly concerned. (laughs) They never last this long. Um, But yeah, so that's exciting. And um, hopefully I live to see it. No, just kidding. Um, But yeah, I think this is great for increasing exposure in the US and, you know, increases the fan base gives you, you know, a space to practice your simming so i'm i'm for it i think this is pretty cool yeah i'm i'm not really a video games person my my extent of you know car based video games is this really random um like I don't know, Nintendo game from the early 2000s that I used to play with a family friend a million years ago. Like that's that's my extent of video games and cars um, at the moment. So F1 are oh, really mine's Mario Kart. Really cool to me. And I also looked at the website. And um, they have, I guess, these designated driver drinks, which are like driver themed non-alcoholic beverages that you can get. So I'm like really curious to see what those menus are going to look like. Um, and I just think it's cool. The the one in Vegas is obviously going to be the one closest to me. And unlike Emily, I don't mind Vegas as, as a city. So like I'll hop in the car for a couple hours, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll drag the best friend with me because he'll have absolutely no protest and we'll we'll go check that one out but i think we definitely do have to check out boston and i think dc is really random um for for a location but that's what the overlords decided <laughs> the overlords um yeah no i mean i don't hate vegas i would go i just i'd prefer to go to boston agreed yeah um, so anyway, speaking of, of DC, um, as, as we know, Andretti has been in the news for, you know, Congress is looking into like some antitrust stuff related to F1 saying no, and then, um, to, to Andretti's bid for 25 or 26, which we all know is going to happen once the new Concord agreement is signed off on. Um, and, you know, 
whatever, you know, we'll, we'll get there eventually. I don't think Congress is going to do much, but a big move that Andretti is making to continue showing their, um, uh, you know, insistence that they're not letting this thing lie is um, Pat Simons, who had just announced that he was leaving Formula One. He was their outgoing, uh, her is their outgoing chief technical officer, or words. He's their outgoing chief technology officer. Um, and he announced he was leaving Formula One. And then like the next day, Andretti's like, hey, we're hiring him as our um, executive engineering consultant, um, which will be starting after he finishes his garden leave period, which those dates have not um, been, wow, you're, you're having a really great day down there. Um, those dates have not been firmed up, but will be happening at some point. But the question is, is like, is this going to be the start of Andretti poaching more and more, you know, engineering technical people from, you know, Formula One and other current teams? I mean, I think it would be smart. Obviously, they need people. And like we've said in the previous episode, there's only so many people with this experience that you have to poach from other teams. And I think for them... Right. It looks like, you know, they really are dedicated. They will bring a team to, the, you know, F1, and they're going to build the best case they can. And naturally and logically, that would mean poaching high-level people from other places. I mean, Andretti is a very well-known brand and name. They have money to back it up. So I think, you know, we all know money talks and people want to be a part of something maybe new and successful and I don't know I, I think this is not the first hire we will see for Andretti so I agree yes I think yeah I mean who knows start poaching yeah maybe this is where Nui's gonna go once he's done at Red Bull in 25 maybe Can it's not stop talking maybe he's going to end about... and he's gonna build Andretti <laughs> we need to stop talking about Nui and 2025 moves because we are in 2024 i know that goes against talking about andretti but it's semi-relevant so I don't know. yes exactly but let's let's talk about other more important things going into this weekend yes let's so mclaren has unveiled a senna tribute livery it's cool it's very different there's no orange um it's it's just not an imola like, that's what I'm struggling with. Like, everyone did so much to honor and pay tribute to Senna in Imola, where, you know, he did pass away. And I, I, like, I like the intention. And it's actually, you know, a full-on let's change up our livery livery, not like throw random blue Ferrari. Right. But it's like a day late and a dollar short. Like, why Monaco? Why not last week? This seems like an afterthought or like some a missed a missed idea. I don't know. I'm struggling with this. Yeah, the the one thing when I was looking into this cursory last night when I was when I was doing our rundown is I think that the reason why they waited for Monaco is because Senna is the winningest Formula One driver in Monaco at the Monaco Grand Prix. So I think that could be it. But that said, Everything was happening last week at Imola. You had Sebastian Vettel, you know, drive, driving one of Senna's cars around. You had yeah. all of the hype, all of the hoopla. You know, he organized that run on the track. They had all of the memorials. So I, I agree with you. It's a little late. I think that, like, the livery is nice. Um, it reminds me a lot a bit of, like, at first glance, I'm like, oh, that's a Renault. Um but like I, I understand the history and I understand the importance of it, um, and the the you know you know great int intrinsic ties to Formula One and people who have been you know aware of motorsport for a little bit longer than we have. So I get it, um, but yeah, it it doesn't necessarily feel like it fits with Monaco just purely based on everything that everybody was doing last week. I a hundred percent agree. It like I get it, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, and it's like you can make a case of like you know Monaco is the place where we've had a bunch of like really outlandish liveries over the years, specifically the the Jaguar and the hundred thousand dollar missing diamond, um, the Star Wars um, livery with Red Bull a few years back, and by few I mean like nineteen. Um, 
And, you know, it, it's a place where, you know, teams will bring in these really great showcase liveries. But when you add to the fact that, every, you know, all the 30th anniversary stuff was going on last week, it does feel a little bit like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're acknowledging it more, too. Yeah. Again, this had to have been approved by a thousand people. So a thousand people thought this was a good so idea. So many people. <laughs> and again, just going like on I feel like this kind of missed is that Oscar is also doing a Senna tribute helmet this weekend there again there was a lot of tribute helmets last weekend at Imola for him so this just feels like they forgot or something like they're doing all of the tributes everything a week late again I get the I get the argument that Senna was the most winning driver at Monaco but like you pointed out there was so much going on last week it just it feels like it fit better last week than this week but I appreciate the tribute. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I do too. Um, I think that Piastri's Senna tribute helmet feels a little bit more modern than the one that we saw from Pierre Gasly last I agree. week, um, which I know we didn't mention in Imola, but it it was there. It happened. It was it was nice. But then you made a great point before we started recording is that when Senna was driving, they didn't have the fancy helmet designs that we have now. And we have been so spoiled with these really great helmet designs and these really great one-off designs that it makes sense that those that these tribute helmets are not going to look like that because that's just not what they were driving back then. Right. I think Oscars is a, a modern update, like you said. And I appreciate that Gasly went very true to the original design like it was very much a Senna tribute helmet to the helmet he was wearing at the time so I yeah. can appreciate and Oscars it Oscars isn't just... too far of a, a departure no, it's, it's just it's just a little bit more modern and I think that is something that I can really appreciate I I also um, wanted to mention that last week in Imola, a lot of drivers were wearing like the Senna balaclavas under their helmets, which I did think was pretty cool. Cause like, that's a yeah. way that like, you don't have to do a full on helmet, but also still acknowledge it. And I think there were a number of drivers who did that as well on the grid. Yeah. Pretty cool. Okay. Well, getting to the Monaco Grand Prix itself, if you don't know about Monaco, I don't know what rock you're living under. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but Monaco is a very historic, very cool, very glitz and glam race. Everybody knows about Monaco. And personally, it's one of my favorite races just for how, I don't even know words for this, but just how much surrounds Monaco. That's why it's one of my favorites. Are they, is it always the most entertaining race every year? No, because it's really hard to pass, and generally the grid doesn't change much, a la Akon making podium um, a few years ago. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, Last year. Time, Catherine. I can't. I, I know. know. It could have been five years. It could have been yesterday. I still don't know. Um, but I really like it just for how cool it is. It brings a lot of attention. My friend's actually in Monaco right now. I think he's in Kane now. Oh, but my God. God. Um, but he sent me pictures of them, like putting it all up with like the, uh, Pirelli big banners and everything. And it just, there's so much that goes into it with the port behind it and all of the yachts, like it's just money dripping. And I think it's really cool. So yeah, there's my spiel on Monaco. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine, I can't imagine actually living in Monaco, dealing with the Monaco Grand Prix race weekend. Obviously these people are like absurdly wealthy so like it matters less than like if you're in Vegas trying to commute to your work at your hotel job um but it's it's just it's fascinating to me like the the principality of Monaco is not large no. and most of it becomes the racetrack when you're when you know on on race weekend it's it's absolutely it's incredibly unique i know that you know in recent years there have been discussions of like some issues with this is the shortest track on the F1 calendar and it's under the current minimum of how long a Formula One track can be. Um, and they also pay the least, you know, in their entry fees because, you know, Mo the Monaco Grand Prix has existed since before Formula One has existed because Formula One, the first year was 1950 and the first Monaco Grand Prix was 1929. Um, but it's, 
you can't, I, I, I don't think you can, you know, try to step away from the history of just how in, intrinsic Monaco is to Formula One. And if you have, you know, one race a year where it's not perfect, it's not wonderful, then let Monaco be that race because of what it means to the sport. Yeah. And I think I was watching a video or reading an article. I can't remember which one. But if you ask every driver, like, what's the one race you want to win? They all say Monaco. Like, there's so much history there. And it's such a, you know, big deal to win at Monaco, to race at Monaco. I don't think they can ever get rid of it just because of the history there regardless of if it's under the minimums or whatever I think we can always make an exception for Monaco yeah and and I think there always should be like we know it's not perfect racing we know that it's a bear to overtake and that you have to qualify well but let that be the challenge for Monaco especially given the backdrop that we have and obviously we just saw an Imola you can't overtake an Imola you have to be good at qualifying um you have to you know make sure your tires work but at least in monaco the backdrop is a little bit more exciting and i've been seeing a lot more lately of questions of like has formula one outgrown imola itself i think that answer could be yes um without having done a lot of research into it i think that answer could be yes but i don't think that formula one is ever going to outgrow monaco no i don't i completely agree and honestly i think it's really interesting and and poses the question of you know how important is qualifying because we have some tracks where it's it's wide enough in almost the entire track where you can overtake obviously you're not going to overtake in certain corners and things like that but there's more opportunity to overtake and you know you could qualify in what p9 like max has before and and overtake and win um that's not necessarily possible in places like imola and um monaco but it does force them to really qualify well and it really brings qualifying into being the most important thing of the weekend i think for for monaco right exactly and if if you look at say a haas car that does qualify well but is awful on sunday monaco could actually be a really good weekend for haas i know and spoiler alert i took into account qualifying so much in my predictions this week I did too and also I like not to get too ahead of ourselves but I did I didn't like throw Albon on the podium like I did last year but I did maybe take some risks just only so that we're different this week and if we're not I'm going to be (laughs) shocked yeah I, I I I hope we're going to be different um We'll see, but we'll get there. Um, before we we keep going, the, the other question, um, and you know, as we've said, this is one of the shortest tracks on the calendar. And not to bring up our least favorite word when it comes to Formula One, um, and our least favorite topic when it comes to Formula One that we just can't seem to shut up about. But we've discussed in the past that um, short tracks do better for Formula One sprint races. Monaco is the shortest track on the calendar, it so. Is. I proposed this, that I wanted Monaco to be a sprint. I know it never will be a sprint. However, I love that idea. I really, really do. Right? Yes. I, I just think that there is every opportunity for Monaco to be an exciting sprint race. Will it be a sprint race? Absolutely not. But it might, should be. Catherine, if they ever make Monaco a sprint race without making every single weekend a sprint race, I will eat my shorts. I mean, you're probably right about that. But yeah, I I I do I I do think that this is something that Formula One will never consider, but probably should. Also, only Monaco could get us to willingly talk about sprint races. See, just look at it. Look at us. In a positive way. I know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In a positive way, willingly talking about it. Okay, before we jump in to our predictions for this year, let's just recap a little bit what happened last year. Um, It was one of the best qualifying sessions I think we saw all year last year. Right? Like, that that Q3 performance between Verstappen and Fernando Alonso was, I, I do think, the best Q3 we saw out of any qualifying session last year. Monza last year was really, really good as well. But I think, I think you're right. Ooh, Monica you're right. The yes. Cake. Yeah. 
So between the two of them, but it was a really big battle between Max Verstappen and Fernando Alonso. And it was like, I was on, I remember this so clearly. I was like on the edge of my seat, like sitting and waiting and like so excited to see what happens. Also, like not just because it's exciting, but because quality and how the grid starts is so, so important to Monaco. Like that's the qualifying I love. Yeah. Not the qualifying in, that we had at Miami. Like if you look at the two, they are worlds apart. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, yeah. But yeah, and like we were saying earlier, qualifying is so important because last year, Ocon, as Catherine pointed out just like five seconds ago, um, qualified in third. So he ended up on the podium. It was Max, Fernando, and Ocon last year. Um, I bet my life that that will not be the podium again this year. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, SD Bestie will not be back on the podium. Um, but it was it was an exciting moment for Alpine. It was an exciting moment for not having the same, you know, four drivers on on you know taking up the three spots on the podium. Um, yeah. And and really shows you know when you think of the three podium positions plus Lewis Hamilton had fastest laps. So you have a lot of different drivers doing you know different things. And obviously, Lewis was you know debatably it may be in a, a better car last year we don't really know yet because this car you know the mercedes is also not great this year um but it, it really shows that that monaco is one of those races where you really are never going to know what is going to hash out by the end of it because you can have you know you're you could be straight in the wall you can you know be you know qualify badly and you're screwed because you can't overtake and you have to depend on um your pit stop strategy and pray for a safety car we didn't get a safety car last week which shocked the world um yeah. so this this has every opportunity to be really interesting plus i checked the weather forecast before i started oh, no. we started recording and there is a there's a 50 percent chance of rain on saturday on quality day Oh my God, Catherine. My heart is pounding so much right now. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Th so there is every chance that we get a very screwy mixed up grid. And then Sunday is just going to be a complete banana pants. If it wasn't exciting before, it is now. <laughs> yeah. And also something to consider. I feel like, I feel like this is going to do it, Catherine. I feel like the rain and the weather might bring on another year of the Monaco curse. Yes, which is is very interesting because the Monaco curse has really not been very Monaco curse-ish the last two years. But in the grand scheme of Charles Leclerc's Formula One career, he didn't do too great in his home race. No. So he is a Monegasque driver, which means he's actually from Monaco, a lot of the drivers take up residency there, but they're not actually from Monaco. Charles Leclerc is from Monaco, and he really struggles at his home race. Yeah. In in the first three of, of four races, he DNF'd three three times in his first three attempts and then didn't even start the race the, the year after finally managed to scrape together a p4 finish in 2022 but it was from pole so you yeah so it's not a guarantee that you're gonna win from pole and then last year he finished p6 um but if you count the um 2022 monaco historic grand prix which was before the monaco the f1 gp um in 2022 um he crashed a second time or he he crashed so he he had his like streak of crashes went to five consecutive tries on that track and then finally broke it in the grand prix itself a couple of weeks later but it's like that's not the time that you want to be crashing your car especially when you're i, I don't remember whose car he was driving but it was a historic car um of of someone's that he put in the wall in at his, at his home leave it to leclerc to do that jesus um, yeah. But yeah, so it's always but I'm also a little bit worried in general of Ferrari. Oh, same. And my predictions reflect that. <laughs> yeah, I I just think based on what like based on what we've been seeing from 
A, Carlos Sainz's run of qualifying and then comments that have been made about the upgrades and the upgrades really, I don't think did what Ferrari expected them to do um, in Imola. And since Imola and Monaco are very similar tracks um, in cer certain characteristics, obviously one is a street track and one is not. Um, I, I think that you're I think you're right we might see a resurgence of the Monaco curse and I also just think that this might be a down weekend for Ferrari in general yeah 100 percent. well with that do you want to jump into our predictions for this weekend of course yes Yay! perfect so Catherine and I do predictions for pole podium and p10 and this year to keep it interesting we're giving ourselves points hopefully you all know that by now if not now you do so for pole Catherine who do you have? So, oh boy, <laughs> Max Verstappen has no, 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 no. Wait, wait for it. I know, I know. We have an internet delay because you're in, you're in Argentina, but Max Verstappen has eight consecutive pole positions, um, and that ties the record with Senna that he set last week at Imola. I am not picking Max this week. Do you have Lando? No, I have Oscar. Oscar? Oh my God! No, this is not gonna yeah. go well for me. Okay, I oh love that no for him. no I didn't pick Oscar though I didn't pick Oscar though. Um, okay okay I, okay okay. But I do I do have him doing well. Um, okay, so I have Max. Just I just think Max is okay out for every record and he's gonna do Max things. So you have Oscar and I have Max. At least we're a little bit different here. Hopefully one of us gets it. Watch, it's going to be freaking Lando for who gets pole, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you do have a higher probability of being right compared to, to my pick, just because Max has been the, the pole sitter all season long. But Oscar looks really, really fast. No, he does. He does. Um, so for your podium, then, who do you have on your podium? I mean, I still have Max winning. Um, I in in my head, Max is going to qualify P two and just take the win from from P two. Um, so my my podium is Max, Oscar, and Lando. Oh my order. God, Catherine! No. <laughs> Did we do it again? No, we didn't. But. We were had the same train of thought. Okay, I good. had Max, Lando, Oscar. And I was like, you know Brilliant. what? This we're is so, so out of this. the box. Catherine is never going to pick two McLarens. And okay. I did. Okay, P10. P10 we pick because it's the last position on the grid that gets points. You get one point for P10. We give ourselves three because it's fun. Who do you have for P10, Catherine? Okay, so my P10, I absolutely have believe that I have every opportunity to shoot myself in the foot. But as I previewed earlier, I think that Haas is going to have a solid weekend. Um, so I, I think that Nico Hulkenberg is going to finish higher and we're going to have Kevin Magnuson in P10. And now obviously if, if Matt K Mag's totally bins it in qualifying, this, this my pick is screwed. But if K Mag's qualifies well, I can see a double points um, finish in Haas's future and Hulk is somewhere up higher. That stresses me out. I know, right? What am I doing with myself? Well, what am I doing with myself? I have Alonzo. Ooh, interesting. I know. Because they haven't been qualifying well, just o across the board. And I think... Right. I think that their upgrades were not like true, true upgrades. So they're still going to like be struggling a little bit this weekend. So I don't know. I felt, I feel decent about it. I th I think it's based on his performance lately. I think it's totally reasonable. Yeah. Is it what we we'll want see. out of Aston Martin? Probably not, but I think it's reasonable. Same, same. Okay. Moving on to our fun, our fun picks now. Um, what is your biggest surprise of the weekend? My biggest surprise is that, we're actually going to have an exciting Grand Prix race. So I think we're going to have a, I think qualifying, if, especially if it rains, is going to be wild. And I think it's going to lead to an exciting Grand Prix race and it's going to be a little less parade -y than usual. Okay. I like that. Good call. I, I just have that we're going to have a completely mixed grid. I think we're going to be really surprised by who makes it into Q3 and who doesn't, especially with now with weather. Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. And who's going to do a dumb? I have a feeling we might have the same one here. <laughs> what do you ha- what you got, Catherine? Well, I think the writing I think the writing is already on the wall that Ferrari is going to do something to to screw up. Um, yep. but I think that my actual dumb cuz I don't know if that's like that's not a surprising dumb, but I think my actual dumb is somebody's going to put it into the wall in the middle of qualifying and like specifically in Q2. I think somebody's going to put it in the wall in Q2 and just screw up qualifying for a good portion of the field that we're like not going to expect. And I think that's going to happen, especially if it rains. Oh, wow. Yeah, because like Q2 is such a crapshoot and everyone's all over the place until the very last minute. So if someone puts it in the wall and they end qualifying, like anyone could be out. Exactly. Especially if they like been it late. Um, so I, so I think that I think of the three qualifying sessions, Q2 is the most dangerous because I don't think we're going to have like Perez putting it into the wall on purpose like he did two years ago because he and Max were mad at each other for reasons. Uh, teammates. Was that 22? I think that was 2022. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. 2022. Yeah. Well, Um, So I just have Ferrari in general. I know that's, like you said, it's not a surprise, but I think they're going to do something so dumb that we couldn't even think of it. And I don't, I don't like rooting against Ferrari. Can't wait to see what that's going to be. Yeah, I don't like rooting against them, but I just, I have a feeling that they're just so out there to try and get Charles to like be this driver that he isn't, and it's just going to mess something up. Yeah, I can see that. So. Anyways, we'll see. We only have a few more days, and I'm very, very excited. Honestly, I think I might be a little bit more excited for qualifying than the race. Um, not entirely, but just a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I'm. I when when I saw the rain forecast said Saturday, fifty percent chance. I immediately was like, oh this could make things really interesting. So I'm really excited to see, because like, obviously we've had rainy qualifying, not really have an impact, obviously in the China sprint that, you know, that happened where it rained in Q3 and then all of a sudden, or SQ3, and then all of a sudden it was just, you know, the same race. Um, And then I think we had, we had a raining qualifying in Brazil two years ago, and then the race was just the same because it was back on on the the slicks um, afterwards. So I I think that Monaco is going to give us every opportunity to have a real big, like you said, mixed up grid um, because of a potential rainy qualifying session. And I'm really excited to see it. And I'm just really excited to like see everything about Monaco and just aspire to be a gazillionaire on my yacht watching a Formula One race. I know. And I think this is one of the the pit walks I like the most because every celebrity, every famous person is there. We get a ton of athletes, lots of international football stars. Um, so it should be should be pretty cool. And I know there's going to be a lot of celebrity there just because um, Con yeah. is going on right now. The the film it's festival, Monaco. which is which is really close. So also that. should be should be pretty cool to see. Um, well, that brings us to the end of our Monaco Grand Prix predictions podcast, but we do still have your fun facts. So Catherine, what is your F1 fun fact for us for this week? So it's a little less fun fact and more my favorite memory of Monaco's past that I actually haven't seen, but I just love so much, um, is my favorite Monaco moment is 2006 when Kimi Räikkönen's um, McLaren, um, the engine blew and it, of course it was um it was a mercedes engine um but instead of walking back to the team garage to the pit lane to the hospitality suite whatever he walked off to his yacht and chilled out in the hot tub for the end of the race which was like uh, i think like almost 30 laps and watched from the hot tub drinking with his friends um and what was interesting is when i was looking up some of the details for that i saw that the car the mp4 slash 21 was actually up for auction um last year they did an auction after the abu dhabi grand prix um in november of 2023 and the car sold for 2.76 million dollars holy shit yeah and it's like, I it's, mean, it's Kimi Raikkonen. We love everything that Kimi Raikkonen he's does. A G, and that's honestly. like the, the most Kimi Raikkonen. Yeah, he he's just such a fascinating driver because like he he was there to drive. He was not there for the fun marketing bits. He was not there for the interviews. He just wanted to be in a car driving really fast and then going off and, you know, taking a nap. Love it. Love to see it. Yeah, it's the greatest. 
Well, thank you for reminding me of that. I mean, I see it on Instagram all the time. Mm-hmm. And there's like so many memes about it, but it's always, you know, yeah. fun to bring it up. And I didn't realize it was 2006. Again, time. I will never figure it out. Time. Never. Time. Well, up next, we will have our Monaco Grand Prix um, recap episode that's coming out on Monday. We'll obviously be following all of the, um, the hoopla this weekend on our socials. So make sure that you follow us on going.off.track on Instagram. And yeah, I've got nothing else to say. So thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>